Thank you so much for coming this evening. It's a delight to be able to share this time with you and to the people who are online. So as you can see, my name is Salome Mwangi. Yes, both names look like passwords. You only need a dollar sign and an exclamation point and maybe a number and you're good to go. <laughs> and uh, I coordinate the Refugee Speakers Bureau at the Idaho Office for Refugees. And uh, I have the delightful job of working with people who moved into the valley as refugees, training them to share our stories in ways that resonate within this community, and then taking, looking for places within the community to share our stories. But for today, I just want to talk a little bit about the refugee journey, because sometimes you see refugees or you hear about refugees, but you really don't understand what it takes for them to get here. So we're going to be looking at who's a refugee, the journey that they take, and more specifically, refugees in Idaho. So a refugee is somebody who has had to leave their country. You have to cross an international border, and you're unwilling or unable to return to your homeland due to persecution or a well-founded fear of persecution based on your race, your religion, your nationality, your social group, or your political opinion. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this is actually the definition that has been adopted by the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, otherwise known as UNHCR. So this is a global snapshot. We have 70.8 million people who've been forcefully displaced in the world today. 41.3 million are internally displaced people. So these are the people who could be in a country where there was a natural disaster like an earthquake or the tornadoes or and so you're still within the country but you're really not living in your home and you're still in a transitional <clears throat> position then we have almost 26 million refugees worldwide and 3.5 million asylum seekers i just wanted to point out that of the 25.9 million refugees only one percent get resettled in a third country. So that would be 259,000. And this is not just in the US, but it is also in other countries that resell re refugees. Once you're displaced as a refugee, you have three options available to you. You can either be repatriated, so it means you go back to your country of origin, assuming that whatever danger you were facing has gone away. You can be locally integrated into the country where you're seeking refuge, or you can go for resettlement. And usually when we're talking about refugees in the US, they fall under the third category. Repatriation is something that happens for refugees often to where the fighting goes down and you go back to your country and then it flares up and then you have to leave again. And it is only when it becomes very obvious that staying in your country will definitely cost you your life. And sometimes by the time they are fleeing and seeking resettlement, it's because many times they have lost loved ones in this back and forth, because all of us want to go home, the homes that we grew up in. Local integration becomes really a touchy subject because the countries where they seek refuge are of the opinion that you know, you're a stranger among us and we are just holding you in a transitional position until you can get resettled. So they're usually not welcome, they usually do not have any rights in the, country, in the countries where they, seek, um, where, where, where they seek refuge. And I know this very well because my ex-husband is from Ethiopia and we met when he ran away from Ethiopia into Kenya. We met, got married, I had no idea about the journey that refugees take. So I was really surprised at how afraid he was for his life, even though he was in Kenya, even though he was registered as a refugee, and that he had no rights, he couldn't work, he could be easily arrested by police if he was seen walking around and didn't have the whatever necessary paperwork they were looking for. So I thought, you know, he's married to me, I'm a Kenyan citizen, let's go ahead and get you registered, let's, let's get whatever paperwork we need for you to stay here. When I went to the immigration offices in Kenya, they looked at me and asked me, is it that you could not find a Kenyan man to marry? And so you want us to adopt this alien 
and make him one of us. And so their conclusion was that I needed to take my sorry ass out of there and go back to Ethiopia, because that is where I belong to now. And all of a sudden I realized, oh my goodness, my own life is in jeopardy just because I'm married to a refugee. Our story did turn out well because he happened to be working. He wasn't supposed to be working, but he was with the International Office for Migration, IOM, and he was doing some translation and some interpreting work. And somebody who knew that he was not authorized to work told him, I'm going to rat you out. And he came home and told me, I don't know what I'm going to do. I think I'm going to be in trouble. So I advised him, instead of waiting for somebody to rat you out, why don't you go and talk to your supervisor and say, this is going to be my last day and this is the reason why. And so he went the next day and he did that. And by a stroke of luck or divine intervention, whatever you want to call it, turned out that his supervisor was actually the wife of the regional director of IOM. And so he was able to make a recommendation. He listened to his story and realized that his story was credible and that he obviously couldn't go back to Ethiopia. And so he's at the same level with the US ambassador to Kenya. So he was able to make a referral. These are very, very rare. In fact, when I talk to people, they tell me we've read about it. We've never heard of a case happening like that. So we were referred to the US embassy to go through the resettlement process. It still took us two years to go through the process of being vetted and going through the medical and making sure that all our ducks were in a row before we were finally able to travel here. So obviously we tried local integration and that wasn't going to work for him. So we had to go for resettlement because there's no way I could live in the house with somebody who was really scared of his own shadow. Currently, 57% of the refugees come from three countries, from Syria, Afghanistan, and South Sudan. 80% of refugees end up living in countries that are neighboring their own countries of origin, usually because of the language could be similar or easier to pick up. The way life is done is at a more familiar level. And the three top hosting countries are um, Turkey, Pakistan, Uganda, Sudan, and Germany. <coughs> so this is Kakuma camp in Kenya. As you can see, it is not a walk in a park. And refugees are normally situated in the furthest, you know, as far away from everybody as you can. In order to travel from Nairobi to Kakuma, it takes you about three days. It's a 45 minute flight. But if you're going to go by road, it takes you about three days just because of how rough the terrain is. And sometimes you cannot travel during the night without police escort because of the insecurity on your way there. This is Dadab camp, another camp in Kenya, and these kids are collecting water that they're going to drink and bathe in and use to cook. This is Kasulu refugee camp in Tanzania. So if you have a refugee telling you about, talking to you about living in their tent, this is what a tent looks like. Nothing like what we call a tent back here. That is a camp in Thailand in Nepal, and this is actually a school for refugee children. They're not allowed to integrate into the uh, local schools of the country that they're in, and, but in some places they're able to set up schools that are just for the refugee children. This is a camp in, you, in, in Egypt. And I don't know if you can see very clearly, this woman's tent has been flooded. Maybe there was torrential rains, maybe there's a river whose banks burst. And so she really doesn't have anywhere else to go to. As you can tell, our kids still find joy in the simplest of things, even for this little guy in a refugee camp in Jordan. This is an illustration of the ceiling, the annual ceiling that has been set and the number of refugees who actually come in. And as you can see, for majority of the part, the numbers that are resettled are always below the ceiling that has been set. The ceiling for this uh, fiscal year is 18,000. And I can assure you that 
we will not receive 18,000 refugees in this year. So the Refugee Act was um, put in place back in 1980, but this was the official recognition of it because refugee resettlement had been going on before then, but this was the first time it was enacted. And this year is the lowest, we are seeing the lowest number of refugees who are allowed to enter into the US since the program started. As you can see, no religious groups have been spared. A lot of the stories that you'll hear make it sound like it's just the Muslims who are not being allowed to come in. There's also the Christians are at 48%, the persecuted Yazidis and persecuted Christian minorities are almost at 100%. Mm -hmm. The other column shows you the numbers that were resettled just here in Idaho. In uh, financial year 16, it was almost 1,200, and then it dropped by almost a half. And then it went down by almost another half. 19, uh, 2019 was a little bit better, but we have no idea what 2020 is going to look like. So we'll try to put together information about the the people, majority of the people who are coming here are from the Congo, 65%. And then you still have people from Ethiopia, Sudan, Russia, Nigeria, Burma, <coughs> hate frogs, anyway, Ukraine. And then the majority of the languages that are being spoken, Kiswahili is the number one language, happens to be a language that I speak, so it kind of keeps me busy. And then you have Arabic, and then smaller languages like Kibembe and Kinabishwa. I love this picture because it shows it doesn't matter who you are, you're welcome here. In the Magic Valley, there is a program called Bridges, and it's a program that is building refugee independence by connecting communities and cultures. Here in Boise, we are a certified welcoming city. And Welcoming America is an internationally recognized nonprofit that is leading the movement of communities welcoming immigrants, refugees, and really all people. And I'm really excited that Boise has taken this step and received this recognition and certification. So each person's journey is different. There's a persecution and flight, there's ending up in a refugee camp, or you can also be an urban refugee. Say, for example, my ex-husband lived with me in Nairobi, so he was not in a refugee camp. He's considered an urban refugee. Average stay in the camps, if you're lucky, is five years. I've talked to many people who tell you, I was in a camp for 17 years. I was in a camp for 20 years. And then they go through the screenings and there's the health screenings, there's the background checking screenings that are done at different levels. And you'll find that since they're done at different timings, it's almost impossible to get a travel date because maybe by the time you're getting your travel date, your medical has expired and now you have to wait until you go through. Mm -hmm. Or by the time you're getting your medical and everything is okay, oh, wait a minute, your background check, certification expired. And then finally, when you jump through all those hoops, you get to resettlement. And there's very many people who are involved in this. There's the UNHCR, United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. There's Congress and the President. There's the Department of State, Human and Health Services. There's the national and local resettlement agencies, the state and local governments, nonprofits, faith-based organizations, and individual donors and volunteers like yourself. So right now we have two resettlement, three resettlement agencies, two in Boise and one in Twin Falls. They offer case management, employment services, immigration, and language learning opportunities. Now these services, the, the temporal, temporary financial assistance is limited to eight months. So in eight months, you're supposed to be able to navigate the system, speak enough English, to get you into a job and become self-sufficient because that's the goal of the resentment process. You also have food, housing, and healthcare, but again, it's all temporary. 
In a new country is when you realize you really are never going home again. You lose your family and you've lost your family and friends. You've, you're, you're losing your culture that you're familiar with. You've lost your understanding of what medical care looks like. There's always concern over cultural adaptation. Do I have to give up? Do I have to, to embrace cult a culture that is very different from my own? There's obviously the concern for economic survival. Will I really find a job that will help me pay the rent and pay the bills? And then there's daily survival issues. How do I take the bus from this point to the other? And the obvious language barriers. There's also opportunities for success. Agricultural and farming product, uh, projects, I'm sure you've heard of the, in the farmers markets, you've probably interacted with many refugees who are able to grow their own food, some that they can sell at the market and some that they consume themselves and others who came here as refugees. These jobs, some are able to get recertified. Maybe you are a medical doctor, maybe you are an in engineer in a profession to where you're able to go back to what you were able to do before. Families do get reunited. Once they get separated, sometimes it takes coming here and being able to trace back the dots and get connected with them. And there's education for themselves and their children. I am one of those who was able to come here, go back to Boise State and get my college degree. I have no clue how I did it because <laughs> I was going to college full time, working full time. My daughter was three years old. Oh, gosh. I was a single mom. And I always had to work a part-time job because the full-time job just wasn't cutting it. There's interfaith partnerships where you find that regardless of what faith you subscribe to, welcoming the stranger is a common belief and a common um, culture. Refugees come here and they belong to different faiths. And we have a long history of faith involvement in resettlement. So sometimes people ask, what can I do? Regardless of your faith, you can sponsor a refugee family, you can have donation drives, you can host a friendship dinner, you can offer space for ethnic community gatherings, and you can be a part of that. You can volunteer to help with transportation and housing and searching for jobs and just standing with your new neighbors in challenging times like the ones we're living in. I'm grateful for Albert Einstein that all of us seem to recognize as um, a refugee who really benefited his country. I also remember um, Madeleine Albright, the first female Secretary of State, was also a refugee. Mm. That's it. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. So you guys threw me off on your order. Brittany, are you, are you going next? I'll go next. I'll call her out on it. <laughs> okay. I just liked your first slide, so that's why I called on you. <laughs> Pretty. That was really close. <laughs> I shouldn't have brought my water up here. It's a lot of. I've never used a clicker. You don't have to. You can use the mouse or the arrow on the keyboard. Got it. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out. I'm glad that uh, it looks like we have two tables worth of people here now instead of our one that we had earlier. Um, so thank you, Sarah. Thank you to Salami and Melinda, who's going to be speaking shortly, uh, for the opportunity to be here and for the people who are listening again or watching again. Uh, my name is Brittany Sigliano. I am a community member. Um, maybe an agitator sometimes too, but we'll stick with community member. So this evening what I'd like to do is start with a little bit of history on communities, um, offer a few examples, and then talk about why we build community and the value of broadening communities. Um, but I do want to pose a question to you all first, and that question is, what is your definition of community, something I want you to think about as we go through this evening. So Webster gives his own definition of community. Um, it's a long list, but the first one is united, a united, unified body of individuals, um, a social state or condition, and society at large. 
this might be very different from your own definition. So a little bit of history. Um, the practice of communities has been around forever, but they look very different decades ago, centuries ago from what they look like right now. Communities, when they started hundreds and hundreds of years ago, were really about survival. Um, they were less about the socioeconomic statuses that we see in communities today. That's not to say that there weren't hierarchies within those communities, but it was more about survival. Um, you were placed geographically to resources, whether it was river, whether it was being able to hunt um, your geography determined your access to resources, your access to resources determined your survival rates. Oftentimes there was a religious component, um, and if you did not follow those religious teachings, you could be banned from that community, thus risking your survival. Moving, moving ahead, looking into the early 19th century, in the US at least, we start seeing the country expand west. Um, populations are increasing. This is starting to give us a little bit more of that socioeconomic status because we're seeing these urban centers really start to grow. Um, we're also seeing some real communities growing with farming and agriculture. Um, additionally, we move to the Industrial Revolution, starting cr to create factory jobs, bringing in more immigrants for those jobs, and actually then bringing some of the rural community workers to work in the factories as well. So these populations of people that are being brought in, rural workers, immigrants, naturally start forming their, forming their own communities within this larger urban area. Um, and this is sort of a community structural change that we start to see shift. It's less about survival and it's more about who you know and what you're comfortable with. Settlement houses were established. Um, this is a, the famous whole house in Chicago. And these were established to help immigrants in the cities adjust to their new life in the city. Um, if you are a farm girl, it's kind of hard to get used to living life in a big city. A lot of fun, but um, you know, think back industrial revolution time, how challenging that would have been, especially if you were an immigrant coming from a new country, thrust into what were often not good working conditions. Um, so these settlement houses helped refugees settle um, and were essentially the first community centers. So during the same time, we see a rise in the importance of education, a rise in the importance of sciences, uh, providing knowledge and tools to help stretch our resources. And again, making that community shift that it's not, communities not just for survival, um, but that we were having this structural change. In 1915, there was a conference held by the National University Education Association and they brought for the very first time the idea of community service to this conference. Um, in the early 1920s, then we start hearing the term community development. And by mid 1930s, universities across the country are offering these community development programs. Also in the 1930s, um, community activist Saul Alinsky, how many of you have heard of him? couple hands. Um, he created what was called the Back of the Yards Council. And the Back of the Yards was his neighborhood. The council was essentially um, what we would probably consider a neighborhood association. And that was because he needed to create neighborhood stabilization. That council still exists today. Um, he took his activism a step further and created the Industrial Areas Foundation in 1940. I doubt that was their logo in 1940, but that's what I could come up with for today. Um, so this, this Industrial Areas Foundation showed that major organizational work could not only produce power, but it could also, and more importantly, I think, produce participation, thus affecting the change um, and often crumbling some of those institutional barriers that individuals would have to fight, again, fight against. So again, we're seeing this community structural change. 
naturally, like all good things, the government wants to get involved. Um, so we start seeing the um, development of community development departments in cities across the country. Boise happens, I think, to have a very good program. Fast forward a bit, um, you know, our 20th, 21st century, we're in a, in a very mobile society where we are much more independent. We live longer, we can work in one place while living in another place. Um, we don't have the multi-generational house, households where we're caring for our elders that are living at home. Um, we've moved away from that. It's, communities are more structured, more formed. Um, we're you're looking at more planned unit development areas. Our senior populations, we're saying you're 55 and older, head off to a community. Thank you for your service, goodbye so long. Um, not that retirement communities are a bad thing, but we set this, this idea that once you reach a certain age, you no longer provide a resource for us, and we need to make way for new. Um, I don't necessarily believe in that argument. I believe that that shows ever more that our communities indeed are needed for survival. So, May of 2014, um, I was preparing dinner, listening to nightly news when Brian Williams was still on, and all of a sudden he started talking about this movement called the Village to Village Movement. And I stopped cutting, ran to the living room, knife in hand. I'm sure it was a terrifying vision from my front window. Um, but I was memorized for the three minutes that he was talking about this movement. The Village to Village Movement is something that was started back in Boston um, in the Beacon Hill neighborhood. And it offers a choice to going to those retirement communities or going to assisted livings. It offers seniors a choice to age at home. It struck a chord with my heart and it just, it resonated very loudly. That within the next week, it was either a next door post or an email talking about Boise starting their own village movement. Uh, found out where the meeting was. I think I couldn't drive there quick enough. Met Diane, met a handful of other people who were working, um, and settled in really for the next two years in a kind of a full time capacity to get this nonprofit up and going because the belief that I had, the belief that Diane had, um, and this other lady you see, Susan Graham, who was the president, we believe so powerfully that our own community has the power to care for our senior population. We don't need to say goodbye, thank you, make way, move on. Um, you might ask why, Brittany, you look, you look awfully young, would you get involved in a old senior project like that? Yes, I am young, um, not really. Uh, I have always been incredibly close with my grandmother and listening to her stories and the, the things that she had to overcome during depression era and you know cooking in a house with at this old fashioned stove, no floors, outhouse, you know, these kinds of stories and listening and, and hearing the things that people before me, the things that they had to overcome to pave the way for me to have a great bright future has always been something really important to me. So late uh, February 2016, we opened up the doors, served a great population of people. Um, late 2016, early 2017, I was asked to come back to my neighborhood association to help work um, specifically with the historic districts. I am sad to say that in the fall of 2017, Boise at Home did close its doors, but I, they'll be back. I am convinced they will be back. As I began to work with the historic districts um, in my neighborhood association, which is over in the East End, I also began to work with Preservation Idaho. So now I'm part of my neighborhood community. I'm part of a preservation community. I'm part of this senior community, all siloed, all working independently of each other, but with a, a surprising amount of overlap. So when we talk about those siloed communities, we know that overlap exists. 
um, the preservation community provided me resources to help with my neighborhood community. In my neighborhood community, I saw how great the need was for some of those what I call first and last homes um, and because of working with my senior community. So we have this great overlap in three different areas where you may not originally think there would be. I tend to go towards communities of old things, older people, old homes. I also like estate jewelry. Um, your, your communities might be a, a bunch of anything. It might be a church community, school, a religious community. Maybe you're a beekeeper. Um, all of those communities are very siloed, but if we take a close, deep look, there is an overlap. By default, you are a member of your neighborhood association community, whether you're active in it or not. Um, but the question is, why even be part of a community, let alone even consider building a community? As humans, it's in our nature to be a part of something. Um, it's in our nature to survive. And we do that by being part of something that we're drawn to. We're, there's a common thread that brings us to that community. Communities offer us support. They offer us knowledge. They offer us inspiration, safety, and a connection to something. So can we build a broader community beyond our siloed communities? And is there even a value in doing something like that? You may all remember this little event back in 2017. Um, this event triggered communities from all across the city to come together for a very common purpose on really what was a very isolated issue that was not going to personally affect many of the people actually working on this issue. Um, a majority of the people that came to work on this issue did not live in this apartment complex, yet there was a common thread. There was an overlap from their other communities to want to be a part of this community. Um, our very own Saul Alinsky moment of participation, I think is what we really saw here. And I would argue that um, this event led to the lar larger conversations that we have had in the city of Boise, that the city of Boise prompted our community conversations on growth and housing. Um, it wouldn't have happened, though, if people from their siloed communities didn't see a common thread in this city and come together. So from my very favorite Deanna Smith said to me just recently, if we were just a collection of diverse yet competing voices, it's more difficult to create the vibrant communities we all want. There are common threads in all of our individual siloed communities, but they all have some overlap. Um, those threads are what connect us to this place this, at this time. And we are all striving for the best possible community, likely taking different paths to get there, as my friend Diane said earlier in the back. But participation, and civil discourse, I do truly believe, will help make this community the most vibrant one for all of us to be in. So I bring it back to my earlier question. Um, what is your definition of community? And it might be a different path than my definition, but we'll get there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I don't know how to get out of it. OK. Here, so. I can help. <laughs> All right, awesome. Thank you. We'll round it out with Miss Belinda. Wonderful. I'm Melinda McGoldrick. Thanks for having me here tonight. I'm really excited. I will say that those are two very tough acts to follow. So I'm going to keep it somewhat brief, um, and then I think we probably have some time for questions as well. So kind of building off of what Brittany was talking about, about why communities exist, 
um, you know, really looking at these opportunities to meet common needs and goals. Um, at first it was survival, absolutely. And now as things have progressed, um, we have all different kinds of challenges that currently face our communities. Whether it's looking at infrastructure things that we need to be able to travel safely, um, whether it's infrastructure in terms of housing that we need for our community, um, whether it's influencing um, the planning processes and the decisions that are happening within our community. There's all sorts of different reasons why people want to be able to come together and then share the power of their voices. Um, and then there's also the piece where we're looking at a sense of belonging. So I think Deanna's quote is great, that if we're all just here kind of separately, um, where's the strength and power in that? And are we really happy that way? Maybe some people are. There are definitely the loners out there. Um, I come from a family where there are folks who definitely just want to live in the mountains by themselves. So I understand that side of it. But for a lot of us, we've chosen to live in a city for a reason. And with that understanding that there are lots of other people in this city as well. And I think a lot of folks are out there searching for that reason that you know makes them feel like this is my home as well. So lots of different benefits to this. But working on that sense of community really can benefit all different sides of what we're looking at today. So if there is that sense of community that, you know, we're all in this together, people are much more likely to want to be involved in that and to also say, hey, I have a skill or something that I can bring to this conversation as well. And then you have the opportunity to learn from each other through that process. So, you know, we don't all know the same things. We have very different backgrounds, but how can we share um, our passions and our projects with each other? And then, you know, kind of build that community of knowledge increasing advocacy. So lots of people think the squeaky wheel uh, gets the grease and there's definitely truth to that. But there's also the truth that one person standing alone um, definitely is entitled to their opinions and might be heard by some. But if your whole community is there, it's a much louder voice for people to have to stop and listen to you at some point. And then of course, your sense of loyalty to your community. So you've invested in this space and you've brought your time and your treasure and your talents to a group of people. Um, and once you've done that, there is that sense that this you know, means something to me and it's something that I want to continue to be involved in and something that I'm gonna be loyal to this group. And then of course, there's the other side of this that once you have kind of that common goal that you're working towards and that common sense among you of belonging, uh, it is much more likely that there is some kind of self role within that group to help people say, hey, that's not what we're about here. And I think that's a big piece of some of the challenges that our community right now is facing with a lot of growth that's happening. People are coming here from other cities and other states. And I think there uh, is to a certain level, a lot of fear that we're gonna lose that sense of community and that sense of what makes Boise really special. Um, but it's also our opportunity to welcome those people and say, hey, look, that's not how things work here. And how are we ever going to do that without the opportunity to talk to them and to bring them in and say, hey, thanks for being my neighbor. I'm glad you're here. You know, on our street, this is kind of something that we do or something that we don't do and kind of helping to bring everybody along in that fashion. And then, of course, that meaningful engagement. So not just, you know, Hey, how are you? But, you know, actually taking the time to learn about our neighbors and learn about what's interesting to them or what types of skills they have or really what they're passionate about and how, you know, that could benefit you personally. It can benefit your community as a whole. So uh, we have to go a little theory on this because, you know, why not? <laughs> but um, doing a lot of research into this and saying, you know, what is it that makes a sense of community? I am not the researcher, but there are many very intelligent people out there who have been studying this and really looking at communities that work well or that are very productive and trying to distill what about them is special and unique. So this is from Dr. David McMillan in an essay or in a paper that was published in the 70s, but I think it still really holds true today that there's kind of these four primary things that really help um, lay that foundational work around what is your community and kind of how do you feel part of it. So looking at membership, looking at shared emotional connections, common goals, and influence. 
So we can break all of these down into different pieces, but a lot of it is things like the slide Brittany had with all different neighborhood association logos up there on it. People, you know, start to recognize those and understand that, hey, in this area, this is the East End, or this is Central Rim, or this is Central Bench, and that's my neighborhood. And, you know, that's something that we all have in common is we chose to live here in this space. And there are certain activities that each neighborhood has kind of unique things that they go out and do, and things that they've really worked to cultivate, because that's what's important to them. Um, so again, that kind of shared idea that we are all part of this together in this area. And then those emotional connections. So sometimes it's to a very specific place. Sometimes there's a really great local park or um, a local coffee shop, whatever that might be in your neighborhood that everybody loves. And you know, if something <clears throat> were to happen to that space, there would be mass upheaval from people wanting to come out and protect it or to preserve it or to clean it up. Um, those are the things that continue to build bonds among neighbors and bring people together in the long term. And that's something that's really easy to welcome new people into as well, right? Um, new people are moving here because Boise is a wonderful place. We have tons of those awesome amenities. So helping them to understand that this is something that we all care for as a community is really important. And common goals. So we talk about this a lot in my world especially in the work that I get to do with neighborhood associations and other community groups is why are you here, right? Why do you exist as an association? What kinds of things do you really want to work on? What's important to you? And helping people to identify kind of what are our values? What are those big picture things? And then what kinds of projects do we want to work on in our community that's going to help further those goals and that mission? So I think um, Deborah brought up earlier today about some projects that Central Rim is working on. And those are exactly the kinds of things that I'm talking about here where they say, it, you know, to us having a space that is safe for our community to gather and kind of have an opportunity to do various placemaking events, that type of thing, um, was really important to them and they felt like they didn't have that. And so they were able to identify a space that, hey, if we all come together and work on this, this could be our space. Um, and then Deborah has done an amazing job. I'm sure she'd be happy to talk to you about it, but of really helping the community imagine what that space could be and bringing people along through that process of identifying, you know, how we're going to get there, who else could be involved, um, and what other resources do they need to be able to make that happen ultimately. And then, of course, there's the piece of influence. So you, as community members, have the opportunity to direct a lot of what happens, or at least to share kind of your thoughts when those decisions are being made around planning, around growth, around what our neighborhoods look like and the character and the feel of our communities. So that really is your opportunity to come out and share those thoughts with us. Because as you know, I work in city government, we have a lot of decisions to make frequently on an ongoing basis, but those decisions can't be done without the community's involvement. It doesn't do anybody any good if three people sit in a room and make decisions without asking people how it's going to affect them. And so having, you know, standing up, showing up to meetings. I know it's not always the most convenient time or place, um, but it really truly is important to be able to come and share your opinion. And people really do want to hear it as we're working on these issues in our community. So it doesn't have to be a monumental task. I think to some extent, even when I imagine like, what if I lived in an area with no neighborhood association, what would I do? Um, how would you get that started? And I think it really can feel really overwhelming. Um, even if you live in an area that maybe doesn't have a very active association or you just haven't really been plugged into that piece of things before, I think it can feel really overwhelming. But never fear. There are many, many really easy ways that you can start building that just on tiny small steps. Um, so to be very uh, upfront, I moved here from another state. I am a transplant to Boise. But I am incredibly grateful that when I got here, my neighbors came over and said, hey, we're glad to have you here. Um, and really, they were the people that I first met when I moved here. And I will never, never forget their kindness. And the fact that now, you know, it's my opportunity to do that as other people have moved into my neighborhood and be the person to go and knock on people's door, even though that feels awkward at times. Um, but just introduce yourself or show up with a plate of cookies or something along those lines. It's a small step that you can make to get to know people. So that's always my first piece of advice, especially when I have people who are like, I'm new to Boise, I want to get involved. I'm like, do you know your neighbors? Because if not, like, please go meet them and then come back and we will talk. Um, it, from there, if you all know each other, that's awesome. Maybe you have kind of a whole street group, have a potluck. Um, Brittany was just sharing with me when we were talking earlier that their street does an Easter egg hunt. 
and i think little things like that that you know are not necessarily a ton of work to pull together are really the things that make neighborhoods fun and unique things that little kids remember growing up if you know if i got to do a easter egg hunt on my street i think that sounds like a lot of fun and i'm sure something that um, all the kids on their street will remember as adults and then hopefully also continue to do with their families and then the big piece of it plan how you're going to keep in touch we have a lot of different ways to do this these days. It's kind of overwhelming at times that there are so many different ways, but really thinking through how you're gonna reach out to your community. So from a neighborhood association level, it's thinking about every time you have an event or have something like that going on, asking people, please share your email address with us. That way we can send you information about other things that are going on. Um, it's having events on Facebook. It's maybe using Nextdoor, all of these different things. But have that conversation with the people around you of like, hey, how are we gonna stay in touch? How are we gonna let each other know if there's something happening in our area? Maybe it's you know some crazy situation with weather where People maybe can't get back to their house or there's some delay or, you know, maybe their neighbor is snowed in and can't get out. Um, whatever that is, knowing how to get in touch with each other is incredibly important. And then ultimately, don't overthink it. You don't have to be planning the next Hyde Park Street Fair for your neighborhood. <laughs> just start, think about a potluck. Maybe it's not even a potluck. Maybe it's just, hey, we're going to all have you know, a beverage after work in our front yards together sometime, or maybe it's popsicles in the summer for all the kids in the neighborhood. It doesn't have to be something fancy. Um, ultimately, this is my job, is to try to provide resources to make these things possible within our neighborhoods and across our city. Um, so we have a lot of different things that we've worked to put together that the community can access that will hopefully make doing these kinds of things easier. So if you are interested in planning an event, I have tons of resources about that and we can help you with this process. Um, if you want to shut down your street, that is very doable. It is not as hard as it sounds like it might be. Um, <laughs> little things like that, that, you know, anything we can do to make the process a little simpler, that's something we are here to help with. We also do a ton of workshops. So we thought the Citizens Planning Academy was so wonderful. We wanted to be able to offer similar things um, about other topics that the community members have come to us and talked about being interested in. So we also have a series, it's called Energize Ed. Our next one is gonna be coming up in April and it's gonna be talking all about planning and zoning in our community. So we try to do kind of a deep dive into topics. Um, each kind of little series has four different workshop topics. Um, we've done housing, we've done healthy communities, and now we'll be doing planning and zoning. And then we also do leadership development for people who are within their neighborhoods and wanting to think about taking on another role, um, kind of looking at other ways that they can be involved. We also have a community conference, which is a great opportunity for people to come, meet each other, meet folks who are also involved in the community, and then also learn from all types of different subject matter experts who come together willing to offer uh, a Saturday to be able to share their information with the community. So our next community conference, it's called the Boise Neighborhood Interactive, and that is coming up in October. So that will be a great opportunity um, for people to get involved if they're interested. We also have tons of resource guides, other ways. If you're the person who wants to read all about something first, we've got that side of it. If you're the person who just wants to host a party, we have a block party trailer. So it is free for the community. Anybody can use it. You just have to reserve it. And it makes, hopefully, it bringing people together a little bit easier. So it's full of yard games, um, like giant Jenga, and cornhole, and tables, and chairs, and ice chests, and kind of all of the things that you would need to throw a block party. Um, we also have a ton of resources in our toolkit online. So ultimately, that is where I will leave it. We have um, lots of different things that we would love to be able to share with you. That is our follow-up information. That way you can stay in touch with us if you're interested. And I'm going to turn it back over to Sarah. Perfect. Thank you. So um, I'm going to welcome uh, our, our panelists back up. I'm so sorry we lost one of our panelists. She had to leave for another um, event. But go ahead and uh, you two lovely ladies come up and uh, sit down at our table up here. And um, do we have any questions that uh, were spurred by the conversation this evening? I certainly have some if you guys don't. Just make sure you use the mics. Okay, then I'm going to ask mine first. Um, I was really intrigued by the Boise at home. Tell me why did it 
not take off? What was it missing? Money. <laughs> In a word. Green lights on. Um, yeah, money. There, you know, we, Idaho, I think, is an incredible state. I love our giving our Giving Tuesday in May because it offers an opportunity. If you get on the Idaho Nonprofits website, it offers you an opportunity to see all of the nonprofits that are in this state. And there are a thousand, at least, maybe more. There's a limited amount of resources to fund all of those nonprofits. And there's a limited amount of philanthropic work to fund all of those nonprofits. Um, it's not for a lack of us busting our buns trying to get access to those resources, and we did get some access, um, but ultimately it comes down it comes down to money, and it's really hard to function. I think the other piece of it too, um, you know, we are doing that, we are living longer, we are much more active, and so many of the people that we talked with, what a wonderful idea! I can't, I just am not ready. And which is maybe true. However, you don't know when you're going to be ready. And oftentimes that moment hits quickly and you need resources in place now. And we had, so it was a bit of an insurance policy, uh, but it was a new organization and people love the idea. Oftentimes we, our members would start out as volunteers. We were able to transition some over, but yes, it does come down. Nonprofits are, uh, they're hard. They're really hard. It was probably one of the greatest learning lessons of my life. Um, but I do, I really do believe in my heart, it will be back someday. I just, it, I don't think it was quite the right time. That was an easy one. <laughs> no question. Uh, it's more, I work in neighborhood associations and one thing that I observe, one example, for example, uh, another neighborhood association president, we were talking about improving an area, adding a lot of uh, apartments in this area. And she was so vehement against it. She said, oh, who wants to live in an apartment? And uh, people prefer to live in the suburbs and have their own place. And, and she was so against these many new apartments in this area. And I was so delighted because I volunteered at Interface Sanctuary. I saw families, five families in one room living in, on bunk blanks with teenagers, girls and daddies, everybody mixed in this room. And I, th I see a value in having a key and being able in the night to lock your house and bring your kids to your own bed where it's clean and safe, you know. So when you have to deal with people that have such strong opinions, oh, everybody should have his own house and it should be in the suburbs and, you know, how do you deal with that? And especially when they are very outspoken and they're engaged in the neighborhoods, they really want to improve the neighborhoods, but they have these ideas that are... Want mm. <laughs> their backyard. You're right. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> What do you think? What, what do you think? <laughs> I, I was thinking, I invite her next time to come along to Interface Center and go help me. <laughs> That's a great idea. <laughs> Absolutely. I think, I mean, it's a huge challenge. Mm -hmm. Personally, one of the things that I think helps people kind of understand the need in our community is relating it back to a person. So I have a wonderful colleague who loves to have those conversations because she says, well, I live in an apartment. Is there something wrong with that? Um, it's kind of the educational piece that within our communities, people are at all different levels. Um, some people, of course, want to own a home, and that's great, and we should be working to provide those opportunities for people. But there's a lot of other people for a whole variety of different reasons where that doesn't make sense for them. So we have kind of baby boomer generations who are retiring and downsizing. They're interested in apartments. We have lots of single people who maybe aren't interested in an apartment either. Personally, I would love to live in an apartment and not have to worry about my yard work and that side of things, but really trying to make it relatable for people. So it's not just those people live in apartments, but like, hey, you probably know someone who lives in an apartment, A. B, do you have children? Would Have they ever lived in an apartment? And what about you when you were younger? I mean, has everybody in this room lived in an apartment at some point in time? Yes. Right. And why did you live in that apartment? 
you probably have all sorts of different reasons, but there are, everybody has a reason. And there, for a lot of people, that makes perfect sense and the kind of you know, opportunity that they'd want to have. And honestly, in our community, anywhere that we can add safe housing for people, um, helping more people be able to access housing is definitely a benefit because there is definitely a shortage. The only thing that I would add would be um, education and you're offering to take her to Interfaith. That's a, that's a wonderful component, I think, and a wonderful way to say it doesn't matter the type of housing as long as we have housing um, and then bring it back to choice. Everyone should get to have a choice of where they want to live and <clears throat> what that looks like. And as long as it's a safe environment um, and it's not harming them or anyone else, it's about choice. And I choose to live in a smaller house with a really big yard. Some days I really want the choice to live in a condo downtown and just to heck with all of it. But I have that, I mean, I have a husband I have to deal with too, but I do have that choice. And that, that's what's most important and I think what's most crucial for us. Good question. One thing that's coming up that I think will be helpful to your neighborhood and, and lots of others, the city is embarking on a restructuring, a rewriting of the zoning ordinances. It's, mm -hmm. it's a project that will take about two years, maybe more. I talked to Darren Flake today at the ULI meeting, and it has been put on hold for the about four or five months, new administration, all of that. But starting next summer, he said, we'll start having a lot of public outreach about how to revise the zoning ordinances so that they will take in um it'll be a different way of looking at space uh, as i understand it it's more looking at the aesthetics and the form rather than you know is it a you know single family multi-family whatever it is it's, it'll have a, a lot more broader interpretation of some of these housing options that people have so that hopefully that plus the stories that you're talking about I think will help people understand that you know building an apartment per se is not good bad or indifferent it's where it is what it looks like what the parking situation is what the transportation is you know all of these other things that play into it and you know it may be that your friend would actually like one of these things once they see the different options that there are. But but you have to get involved, right? <laughs> yes, and just to go on with that, there will be lots of public engagement opportunities later in the summer. Um, as part of our next workshop series in April, we will be doing Zoning 101. So right. if you are not familiar with zoning to begin with, that might be a great place to start and then kind of build in those other opportunities for engagement later on as well. I think it's tentatively April 9th, but don't quote me on that. We're still nailing down details. I'm excited about the zoning conversations, and I think I'm, I'm going to be pushing for this form-based code, kind of mm -hmm. similar to what Diane's talking about, where you have this densification, which we, we do need, but you have it more in this downtown core instead of spreading out, and you're you know, do you, you kind of peak with all your heights in the middle and then as it slowly comes down, so where she will continue on with your friend, uh, where she may hate the idea of apartments out in a more rural area, this type of code will prevent those kinds of things from happening and keep that closer to that core and keep that height and that form and function centralized, um, but still giving people a choice. I have another question. Sarah. So sort of um, in line with, with what you were bringing up. Um, and Brittany, I loved the words that you chose. You said, um, I can't remember the lead in, but it was participation in civil discourse. Um, and so I would love to hear your thoughts on the fact that it seems like, so you had mentioned that community is formed so that people can have influence and have a voice, a common voice. Um, but it seems like a lot of times, um, the voice is much quicker to rally around negative. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yep. and, but when you're talking about civil discourse and the need for, for participation, how do you um, how do you build up and maintain momentum around a positive message and around moving forward and, and uh, cooperation and things like that? 
it just doesn't hold its men, um, momentum the same as that negative. It's hard. Um, most of us don't get actively involved until something goes wrong. It takes a, ne a negative, something negatively impacting us personally before we typically get involved. And it's easier for us to get riled up over something um, negative and get that energy and that momentum built as opposed to when everything's okay and everything's chugging along just how we want. We may say, well, we kind of want this change, but I've got so many other things going along, I'm not going to put my energy into it right now. Um, and Melinda's probably a really good one. We have this conversation, and I know they've done education workshops on it, but it comes down to volunteers, I think, and keeping those volunteers and giving them a purpose in whatever it is you're working towards. And I think it comes, it's the type of leadership either within that particular issue or within a governing body that um, sets that direction and sets that tone. I just had to have, I have a nine-year-old and we were having this conversation in the car the other day. Um, you know, there's someone she doesn't quite get along with and she's been ignoring her. And I said, well, you can't, you can't just ignore, you don't have to have interactions, but you have to acknowledge that she is a human and she is there. And I said, it's kind of like sometimes when I go to meetings and I'm standing up for an issue and the person that I'm meeting with is really angry at me and thinks I'm very terribly wrong um, and may say other things nasty to me, but I always present with a nice face and I always say, hello, how are you? I don't have conversations beyond that but we'd be, we'd be nice about it because then no one can ever accuse you of not being nice. And I said, nobody wants to be on that side of the coin. You want to be on the nice coin. So it was a good opportunity for me to, to break it way down. How can we get through some of these things? And if I think about it um, on a nine-year-old's level, if you be nice, you have good leadership that leads with a positive message, but it's not easy. It's fighting and standing up for what you believe in and keeping that momentum going. Um, it's really hard. It's really hard. I wish I had a more magical. Answer, I, I wish I had something more <laughs> magical. Maybe Melinda has the magic <laughs> answer. <laughs> I, it is incredibly hard. Um, I think what you said about leadership it makes a huge difference in the conversation. Yeah. And maybe you have a ton of people show up to a meeting because they're angry about something. I think it's trying to think through that situation where it's like, yes, everybody's angry and they're yelling. And like, clearly it's because they're passionate about something, right? And they care. So is there an opportunity to try to harness all of those people who probably don't show up to your regular meetings when there's nothing else happening? But can you harness them? Can you bring them in, get their contact information, and then use that passion and that kind of What's presenting as anger, um, which frequently is fear or you know a deep concern for your community, can you use that to translate into an opportunity to think about um, goals for your neighborhood and what your values are for your neighborhood? And then trying to turn that from, hey, we're just here to be angry and yell at each other, to we're going to work really, really passionately on this project because it addresses this thing that we're really concerned about. So is there an opportunity? And it's not easy. I, it sounds easier when you say it like that, but it is not. Um, but do you have the opportunity to try to shift that conversation? And it really is your leadership at that point to be able to kind of guide people back around and say, let's talk about the root cause of why everybody is here, not like the building or whatever is happening in your neighborhood, but let's talk about the concern. And is it because we all like really, really care about this park and this situation here is threatening this? You know, what can we do to be more proactive and to define some positive goals around this and to mm -hmm. sign people up right then? Don't be like, hey, come to our next meeting and we'll talk more about it. Make them sign up right then. Hey, yes, I want to volunteer to be part of this advocacy group to protect this. Or I want to meet again on Tuesday. Be really specific about those kinds of things to say, yes, this group is going to get together again and talk through this issue and this specific thing. Um, I think it really comes back to those pieces though. And then also being able to ask people to come in and say, hey, I understand you're really passionate about this project and you're really upset about it. Will you do this thing that will help us as a community moving forward? Um, I think it's a challenge people run into a lot of just saying like, hey, we're looking for a volunteer. 
okay, like maybe I'm interested in volunteering, but what does that mean? Um, and what do you actually need people to do? So being really specific in your asks for them. Like, hey, you're clearly passionate about this. Can you come, can you do some research on this specific thing and bring it back to the group at our next meeting? And try to try to harness that passion because it can be great and it can be a force for good um, if, if it can be harnessed. Although you're never gonna make everybody happy, so it's. Sometimes you just have that person who wants to be angry. Yeah. Yeah. recognize that one of the things you guys pointed out both of you is how important it is to have informal community gatherings potlucks or whatever and that is one of the that's one of the solutions also because so many times people are in an adversarial position when they're at a meeting but at a social event generally they're not and you, you get a chance to talk to people like I was saying earlier find out what motivates them and how their kids are and whatever and all of a sudden then you can kind of diffuse some of that um, especially in the other in the other situations when you get there yes um, Diane you probably have one of the best examples of your group on next door and you all got together and said, hey, I see your name on next door, but can we actually see your face? Let's do a potluck. And they created something as simple as that, as a way to meet each other and just have some conversations with each other. Um, when I moved to my street, we moved in, in in May, and the neighbor came and knocked and said, so we, we have our own Easter egg party, and we usually use your backyard for... <laughs> one age of the kids can we go ahead and do that by the way welcome to the neighborhood um, you know something like that i my very 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 favorite story of of this is um the liberty park neighborhood association and they're a small neighborhood association they are very low income high refugee population and i was at their neighborhood meeting last fall the things that they are doing are so incredible and the awareness that they have for the people in their neighborhood. Um, they hosted hot dogs with the Hawks because they have a lot of families that host Hawks baseball players. And I said, how, that a great idea. She goes, well, we can't actually serve hot dogs um, because we have a high Muslim population. Wouldn't have thought of that. But they're so tuned in to their neighbors. And I said, you know, we do, Central Bench I know does an Easter egg hunt. We do, and she goes, we can't do that. That's not, you know, religiously appropriate for us to do an Easter egg hunt. Um, mentioned that there was conversations about putting baseball fields. We don't want baseball fields. We need soccer fields. Mm -hmm. And in one of their grant requests that they do, they request every single year soccer balls so that soccer balls can just float the neighborhood. So having, you know, you've got this small group of people with virtually nothing but this common thread, this common bond of wanting to strengthen their own little community. Um, they don't have a ton of money, they don't have a ton of resources, but they do have each other. And they have a few people who are willing to help out and they are a social bunch that wants to get outside and enjoy each other's company. Um, so like Melinda said, start small. It doesn't have to be these huge grand things and now that they've got the block party trailer you are party in a trailer set to go tell people you know a through b bring a, or a through c bring dessert everybody else bring a, a salty snack and you're set you know ina's annual picnic i can't tell you how many bags of chips show up but those bags of chips empty out and people are happy so it's just it's an easy way to just just start small Knock on your neighbor's door. Can we put Easter eggs in the backyard? <laughs> this question's not mine. It's uh, from one of our online attendees. So Gary, if I butcher it, feel free to unmute yourself and jump in. Uh, it's from Melinda. Um, he's wondering if you can speak about the RFP that's out for the Franklin Elementary site. Sure. Oh. Um, so last summer, the city had the opportunity to purchase the land at Franklin and Orchard, which formerly was the Franklin School, if you are familiar. Um, the school district had sold that property quite a long time ago. Um, the school was torn down, which you know the neighborhood was incredibly sad about. Um, and I believe that Maverick had pur purchased that property and planned to build a gas station there, um, which the neighborhood was also not excited about. So eventually Maverick gave up on their plans to 
build on that location and put the land back up for sale. So the city had the opportunity to buy it. And we are using it as an opportunity to demonstrate what a land trust could look like in our community. So um, we wanted to start though by, we're using this as a pilot for many different ideas. So yes, it's a pilot for a land trust where the city will continue to own that land and we will have a developer build on it. Um, the developer will um, own and operate the building and the city will retain ownership of the land. Because we own the land, we can put stipulations on what happens in that building and the kinds of incomes that are served there. Um, our goal is to increase opportunities for affordable housing to be developed in our community. Um, we also wanted to use this, though, as an opportunity to hopefully demonstrate to the development community how engaging with the neighbors and the surrounding community um, will make their project better from the very beginning. So I'm sure you guys have all been to a contentious or heard about a contentious public hearing at some point in time um, where neighbors were not thrilled about what was being built near them. Unfortunately, that seems to be becoming a very frequent occurrence. And it's something that we wanted to say, okay, if we sit down with the community ahead of time and we identify what's really important to them in this process and we get their feedback on all of these different things, can we provide that to a developer and hopefully have the developer look at that and say, okay, I'm going to build something that is in alignment with all of these things that the community has put out there. So this is, this is a test, right? <laughs> we haven't seen any site plans back yet, so we don't know how this is going to work. But our team led a series of engagement events um, in December and January. We had about 400 people come out and take a survey and provide their feedback um, or online. Um, we were there on the site in a tent. I was really glad it didn't snow on us. I was a little worried about that. We also had opportunities at the library where people from the community could come in and share with us exactly what they wanted to see in that space. Understanding that the city's intent is to build mixed income housing in that space. Um, it's also identified as an activity center in our comprehensive plan, that intersection right there. And so we really wanted to see what could be an awesome example of what should go in at an activity center that's really gonna serve the surrounding community. So even if you don't live in that building, something there that um, helps you in some way. So maybe a lot of people wanted to see coffee shops. They wanted to see a small restaurant. They were very clear that they wanted this to be a local restaurant, um, potentially uh, small shops, that kind of thing. Basically things that you can walk to, hang out after work or on the weekend, visit with people. Even if you don't live in the building, it's you know kind of that mixed use component to things. And so um, on February 18th, we opened an RFP with all of that feedback from the community in it. That RFP will be open until the end of this month, so the end of March. And then we will spend April doing our review process and going through all of that with the hope at the beginning of May to be able to um, identify a developer for that space. And then, you know, they will move through that standard process of permitting and all of that fun stuff that happens down the road. Um, so we're kind of helping them through uh, that engagement up front. We also want to make sure that when they go to hold their neighborhood meetings to share site plans with the community that we are well aware of that and helping to advertise them and helping to facilitate that if needed. That way the community continues to be able to have the opportunity to come in and share with them what they want to see in that space. And then ultimately with the hope that when it goes to council for approval, the community is there to support this project. A couple mm -hmm. of questions. Mm -hmm. um, will the park remain? Yes, the park is staying. It's kind of an L-shaped property that goes around the park in that and space. And you only want one developer? Um, we put it out there that it could be a team of developers. It is kind of being looked at as one large parcel. So it could potentially be several different developers um, working together as a team. We're very flexible on that. We did not want to put a lot of restrictions around anything like that because we want them to be creative and tell us what they can do in that space. Um. Not to be a Debbie Downer, <laughs> but um, uh, Cave Idaho, you know, has purchased a lot of property, like they purchased HP, and mm -hmm. it's taken that uh, out of the tax roll, and um, and of course it'd be nice to people that lease the property would pay their taxes. Um, uh, but services are still being provided to that. So, so with a land trust that you're talking about, it would just take the land out of the out of the tax roll, but the development that would go in there uh, for for would pay their taxes on the value of their improvement, but but not the land. I believe so. Yes. However, 
I am not the person who is kind of in charge of all of that piece of it. I think that's something that they're still trying to iron out exactly what is going to happen with the taxes because it is kind of a unique situation. Um, that is something that we want to be able to post all of that information kind of in FAQs because that question has absolutely come up before. Um, we're working to get kind of that FAQs posted on our website to be able to share back out. I don't want to definitively say yes or no though because that's not my area of expertise. But it's definitely something people are very interested in and definitely something that we need to figure out. Well, certainly other taxing entities, um, you know, if they lose that little bit of tax base, uh, could affect their own budgets too. Mm -hmm. So stay tuned to our website. <laughs> Hopefully we'll be able to get those FAQs up there soon. Um, it's cityofboise.org slash Franklin dash Orchard specifically for that project. So if you're interested, you can see we'll be partnering with the Central Bench neighborhood for a whole another round of events, asking them um, more specifically about what other things, in addition to the development that's going to happen there, what other things we can partner with their neighborhood to work on in their community that they really want to see. Um, they recently finished a neighborhood plan, so they have tons of great projects identified, and we'll kind of be working with them to prioritize which ones they want to see move forward. Um, but we're posting all those updates. You can see the whole RFP. You can see all the feedback from the community, everything on that website there. I mean, uh, a little detail in this one. Uh, did the city ever consider working with uh, Humane Society? Um, because it, what we don't have is animals and children things. You know, uh, for example, a child that has, is going through a very difficult time. If the uh, school counselor can identify this kid, he really needs something. In the week or that. So if we had in the parks some collaboration with um, um, human society, some kind of animal that is actually quite easy to care for, and one person that is responsible and teach the children how to care for these animals, um, that would be enrich our parks. We would have something where the little ones can go over up, a bunny, a bunny, you know. <laughs> and uh, all the kids that are going through a difficult time, they have this one time in the week on Wednesday, they go there and they clean out and they are responsible for the bunnies or whatever, or the birds or whatever it is. I think that's also something that could create community and really help children. That's a fantastic idea. Well, yeah. I've heard anybody else bring up before, so <laughs> okay. thank you. <laughs> Perhaps yeah. right? we can one day do something like planting the seeds. Well, I have kept you all long enough. Yeah. Round of applause. Yeah.